Hey there, Cousin here, and welcome back to Always Doing. After what must feel like a long time, I'm here to talk about my booktube prize judging. First things first, if you're unaware of the prize, I will leave all kinds of links down below. It is a literary prize run for booktube by booktube. There are two categories this year. One is fiction, one is nonfiction. I am judging nonfiction. I only want to do nonfiction. I did it last year. It was amazing. So happy to be back. And I was assigned, I know you're all waiting for this, I was assigned group B. I was not all that excited to get this group. There's only one book that I was like, yay! Whereas like group A was all cause and catnip. And here there's some where I'm just like, I don't, we'll see. We'll see. I mean, they could be great, but we'll, we'll see. First is Inferno, a memoir of motherhood and madness by Catherine Cho. And this is something that seems like I should really like because it's medical memoir. I work in medicine. If you don't know, I'm a Japanese English medical interpreter and this seems like it should fit. However, I'm not all that big on narratives that deal with motherhood and pregnancy. And this is about a mother who I believe has severe postpartum depression and ends up having a psychotic break and needing to, and is um, actually like her family has her go to a psychiatric hospital, I believe involuntarily, and I'm sure things will happen. So like, it could be great. I'm giving it that option, but it's not the first medical memoir I would pick up. Then we have After the Last Border, Two Families in the Story of Refuge in America by Jessica Goudot. And I haven't heard of this book before, the prize. So there was that. And I would rather read own voices where I can at the same time I recognize that an outside voice can bring its own journalistic outlook that may have some value of its own. I can't just knock it because it's not own voices, but it's still, I don't know, we'll see. There's Kindred, Neanderthal, Love, Life, Death, and Art by Rebecca Rag Sykes. Another book that I hadn't heard about, it is science-y, I guess. In a way, I mean, there's art and stuff in there too, but the sciencey angle, I'm here for the ancient stuff. The author has to do a good job of making me care about ancient stuff. I found this out about myself in the last iteration of the prize because I read some stuff that was about prehistory and it doesn't always go over well for me. That being said, this is a great review. So it was chosen, chosen for the prize. So like all of these, we will see. Then there's Wilmington's Lie, The Murderous Coup of 1898 and The Rise of White Supremacy by Z David Zucchino. And this ties in more with my current reading because I have been reading about white supremacy and fascism and that's going to be like a winter theme for me, I think. I like how this fits in and it's important. So this one I'm actually, even though I hadn't heard of it before, I'm, I'm here for. I'm very curious to see what all this is about. The book I'm most excited for by far is The Dead Are Arising, The Life of Malcolm X by Les Payne. And this is a biography. I last year read the autobiography of Malcolm X and that was very interesting. I learned a lot. It was an amazing buddy read that we had, but I want to know more, need to know more. And this book, it won the National Book Award. It's been on my radar and I'm very excited to get to it. But here's the thing. I have this on audiobook thanks to Libro FM. It was part of their advanced listening program. And I have been so looking forward to getting to this. I was like, I'm gonna dig into this maybe February because Black History Month and because this is the book two prize, I made it a rule from the very beginning when I started judging this prize that I wouldn't listen to any of the books on audio. And that's because I know I'm very swayed by narrators. And if the narrator is awesome, that will push the book into a higher like star rating <laughs> than if the narrator is awful, that will take away. I want to make sure, and this isn't me thing. This isn't a Robert rule. This is other judges can do what they want. But for me personally, I know that narr audiobook narrators can sway my rating so much that I decided no audiobooks for the price. So I have this very lovely audiobook waiting for me and now I can't listen to it. So again, thank you very much, Libro FM. I'm hopefully going to be re-listening to, listening to that, I should say, on a reread. That would be great, but I'm gonna have to stick with text for this one. And the last book in this group is Stranger in the Shogun City, A Japanese Woman and Her World by Amy Stanley. And this book I was not very much looking forward to reading because it's not on voices. And I was worried that 
because a lot of times, especially in fiction, I gotta say it's mostly in fiction, but sometimes in nonfiction, people who don't have a lot of experience living in Japan, don't know the language, do a poor job of representing and depicting the country in books. So I was a bit worried about this one, and I have to say, as I'm filming this, I just finished this book. Uh, it only took me six days to read. There are only like 250 pages of text. So I'm just gonna go straight into my first review. And straight off, I have to say that Stanley has spent time in Japan. She speaks Japanese. She did a bunch of research here for this book and is very impressive with her region, her knowledge about the era that she's writing about. So that all, phew, worked out. Stanley uses all kinds of historical records, mostly letters, to reconstruct the life of Tsuneno. She was the daughter of a Buddhist priest in Echigo, which at, right now is Niigata Prefecture, snow country, very rural, but her family, her dad's a priest at a temple, and it really affects her life. She's a little bit more well-educated than a farmer's daughter might be. She can read and write no problem. She learns how to sew, etc. And she is married several times. It's arranged marriages. They don't go so well for reasons. And she ends up wanting to go off to Edo, which is now Tokyo, and to try her luck there. Her family is against it. They're lining up other people for her to get married to, but she says no. And she runs off. While this book is nominally about Tsuneno, it's actually about life during this particular era of Japan, most of which is the Tempo era, from roughly 1800 to 1840 or 50. And a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff went on. There were famines. In Edo there were these reforms trying to reinforce status by clothing and what people were or weren't allowed to do. Theaters, like in so many other places, theaters were seen as places of ill repute and like, let's move the entire theater district because we don't like it. Like, a lot of things. And she also talks about, Stanley also talks about in depth, what it was like to live and what you could expect walking down a street in Edo at this particular time, but what peddlers would be about, uh, what carnivals were like. So even though it's mostly about Tsuneno. It's not mostly about Tsuneno. It's mostly about life in Edo at that time. It's impressive how much Stanley was able to pull together about Tsuneno's life. At the same time, there are still lots of holes and lots of things we don't know about her. And she's clear about that. In the book, she'll say Tsuneno might have done this, might have thought that, it would have been logical to this, that, and the other thing, or typical for the time. And it didn't feel like wild speculation. Sometimes I feel like in, in books like this, like, well, maybe she did this amazing off-the-wall thing. It's like, no, she keeps it very reality-based. And another big thread in this is what it was like to be both a common person at that time, someone who flirted with poverty, depending on how their luck went, and also what it was like to be a woman at that time. Japan, even today, isn't all that great with feminism and Me Too, and there are, there's still a long, long way to go. But obviously, way back then, it was even worse. A woman couldn't initiate a divorce. The husband had to write it on a slip of paper and then give that to her, and then that was the divorce. There And then just the way her life, in so many ways, like she wanted to go out and do her own thing, but her life was defined by who she was with, whether she was with her family and was attached more to her father, whether she was with a husband and was attached to him, and when she wasn't, it was, there was some hairy stuff. Something Stanley touches on, but I think is more important than she's letting on, is that Tsuneno never had a child. She had four husbands, she was married five times, one of them was the same guy. It, you look at, it's complicated, but it's not, it's explained well in the book, but never once did she have a child. And you get the feeling that if in her first mar marriage or second marriage especially, if she were able to have kids, all those problems would have worked themselves out because part of the job of a woman at that time and even today in parts is to produce an heir and to have a lot of kids and to keep the family going, the family name going. And one little thing that means a lot to me, and I'm going to try and keep this a mini soapbox, is that Stanley renders Japanese names in the correct order with family name first which usually doesn't happen. If you watch the Olympics, if you hear Japanese names in the news, they are given name first, Americanized order, westernized order. 
And but they're the only ones where that happens. Chinese people get their family names first. Korean people get their family names first. I mean, look, Moon Jae-in, family name Moon. Xi Jinping, family name Xi. Abe, Prime Minister Abe is Shinzo Abe, not Abe Shinzo. So I'm very happy here that the words, that the names were in the correct order. Just thank you. If you don't know much about Japanese history, I would imagine that this is fascinating and very interesting. The writing is assured. It doesn't get overly academic. It's very easy to get through. That being said, I live in Japan. I've been here for 10 years. It was one of my majors. Japanese was one of my majors in university. I had to sit through an entire year of Japanese history. There was a lot of stuff in here that I knew. And so it wasn't as impressive for me, maybe, because it felt like I was kind of sitting in that history class again, going, oh yes, the reforms, oh yes, the shogunate, oh yes, that and the other thing, yes, the teeth blackening powder, just on and on and on. So all in all, well-researched, good writing. If you don't know a lot about this era in Japan, you will learn a bunch, and not only about the politics of the time, but also what it was like to live at the time, which is valuable. But a lot of it was stuff I already knew and I found myself kind of skimming other parts going yes, yes, yes. So while I'm giving it three stars, I think some other people will like it a lot more and that's awesome. I'm glad we have nine judges per group in this round because we'll all be evened out into a good average. So one book down and let's get into the vlog proper, shall we? I ordered tea from Hatavala over two weeks ago. It took, I mean last time it took less than a week to get here. And I think I know why it was held up now, because not only is there the usual kind of customs declaration there, there was a second sheet of custom declaration that was there, and then there was this, which was health inspection? I guess because it was tea? So that was... That's new. That didn't happen last time. But I'm finally, and they, they do an amazing job wrapping it. It took me a while to get in here, but I have my next order. See how much I can do one-handed. Two Sisters Oolong. So I had Two Sisters last time, but I got the 2020, and this time I got the 2019. See if I can taste the difference. This is flowery oolong, and... I know now that I like the ones that are closer to green tea, and this looked exactly like that. Can't wait to try that. Autumn Jade. This was a jasmine tea. I can't remember. One of these was a wild tea. But I like the pinamello flower I had last time. Wanted to try a different flavored, naturally flavored tea. And Five Penny Green Tea. Last time I got Fish Hook, and it was okay. But I wanted to give another green tea a try. Yay tea. I'm here during the February mid-month book bash, which the vlog has already gone up for. I will leave a link. And I am reading Wilmington's Lie. And this book is about rise of white supremacy, 1898, murderous coup, exactly what it says on the cover. And it's boring. It can't... History this explosive shouldn't be boring but it's written as a straight account using newspapers just this happened and this happened and this person gave, gave a speech they said this and then that happened and it's this isn't how i like reading my history i would much rather read something that's been synthesized by a historian put into some context maybe with some kind of lens added to it to but just just straight history i'm not a big fan of i know this book has great reviews i know that there's probably a bunch of people who like it but it's not a me thing and as a result this is taking me a while to get through it's it's hard to tell for the e-reader percentage wise i think i'm about halfway through 250 pages the book itself is over 600 but there's a zillion notes oh and speaking of I'm not very happy about how they're dealt with on the e-reader because it underlines the first three words of any reference instead of doing like little footnote numbers. And it took a long time to get used to because it felt like the first three words of random sentences were being emphasized. It was odd. Not 
don't like it, don't like it. And so, I mean, that's not, I can't hold that against the book, it's the formatting, but it didn't help. For the mid-month book bash, I am trying to read 24 hours worth stuff in four days. So I really, 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 really want to finish this and be past it and move on to whatever comes next. Here you can see the underlining that I've finally gotten used to but got on my nerves in the beginning. But uh, this weekend, as the former U.S. president is being impeached for the second time, and the details of the riot at the Capitol are becoming more clear, this struck me when the procession passed the modest home of the mayor, Silius Wright. Some of the red shirts pointed their Winchesters and hollered, Hang right. My Life's Library subscription has arrived, and I already know the book, but the extras are considered kind of like a spoiler, so normally I don't like putting these in, say, my weekend vlogs, but book two prize vlogs, it's the middle of February. By the time this vlog goes out, this will no longer be a surprise. I know the book, but let's see what else we have. So the book is... How to Write an Autobiographical Novel, Essays by Alexander Chi. This one should be good. I haven't read Chi yet. And this feels great. Is that French Flaps? It is French Flaps. Very nice. And then we have something in here. And then, what's this? So on the Discord, it's split up into different shelves. So that's what that is. And what's in here? Oh, it's all the paper stuff. Is there any? Oh, I see, I see, I see. So we have origami paper, which is kind of funny because it's like dollar store stuff here. And a tutorial for paper crane. And there's always book plates. That's a pretty cool one. And a note from whoever chose it this time. Neat. So I'm filming this and I'm not in my usual peaceful sanguine mood. If that's ever my usual, I don't know. It seems to come across that way even if I don't feel that way. But my phone is actively trying to die on me and after I film this, I'm going to factory reset it and hope that it doesn't turn it into a brick. You already know about this by now, probably. But yeah, so I'm under a little bit of pressure here, but I want to wrap up at least Wilmington's lie for you. The lie is that there was a race riot in 1898 in Wilmington. And that's not the case at all. There was an election and Wilmington had the highest proportion of black people in it in any state or any jurisdiction I'd say within the state and it looked like black people could win a lot of seats in government and the white folks wouldn't stand for that. So the white folks actively uh, harassed the black people, tried to prevent them from going to the polls and used all of these tactics to make sure that black people didn't vote including killing them. And then they blamed the black people for it which is where this lie comes from and this is history that I'm really glad I know about. I'm really glad I read about, but the account that's given here is so factual. It's so dry and it just reads fact, 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 and they're all footnoted and like everything is well sourced, etc., etc. But I wanted perspective. I wanted context. I wanted analysis. And there's precious little of it here. Every once in a while, the author would reword something that was kind of in period, maybe stilted tones. I don't know. I understood it fine. Maybe it's because I read a lot of historical romance. Who knows? But he would reword it into something slightly more modern day. And like that was the extent of the analysis. Until we get to the end. Because at the end of the book, he talks about the legacy of this awful, awful day. And what people, like the descendants of the people that helped precipitate the killing of black people and how they're reckoning with that. And in that section, I finally got a feel for the author's voice. 
I got a feel, we got, I got more of this perspective, I got more of this analysis, I got all of the things I wanted, but it was only at that very end when I wanted it through the whole book. So I had a lot of trouble reading this. I had to prop my eyelids open to get through parts and it was possible. It, it wasn't impossible. It wasn't, as you'll see for later books, something that I had to power read through in the sense of like skimming or something. I was able to read it straight, but it could have been a lot better. It could have been so much more. It could have done a better job of explaining all this history. So I ended up giving it two and a half stars and I, you know what I would love to see? I would love to see, and maybe she's already did it, somebody like Carol A. Anderson discuss this event in a chapter in one of her books. I think that would be ideal. But uh, yeah, this was just not, not all that great, unfortunately. If you watched my February mid-month book bash, you will know that I was waiting for this to pop and it popped. Like if I'd woken up maybe an hour or a half earlier, I would have seen it pop. It's been slowly opening, so yay. My mid-month book bash vlog just went up and I am delighted that people took as much interest in the parlor palm as I do. So I wanted to give you a bit of an update. It's a few days after the last video and yep, it's just still starting, still going. Don't worry, more updates forthcoming. Here we are a few days later. Some progress. Editing Kazan here after the factory reset. My phone is not a brick, yay! And I just had to change a lot of settings for the camera, so I hope that this matches the rest of my footage. But uh, I'm going to end the first vlog here. I would love to hear your thoughts about anything at all down in the comments below. And there will be one more part to this where I talk about the other four books. Thank you for watching. Subscribe if you're new, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye!